Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the SAIEE Free State Centre webinar on the educa education crisis in South Africa, how can we fix it? Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on your device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with each other or, or with yourselves, but you will, uh, you, attendees will not be able to chat with each other. However, I encourage to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available under the SAIEE YouTube channel in the KZN, oh, sorry, in the Free State Center webinar playlist. Uh, you will find in the chat box, you'll find a registration link to register for this, um, the, the YouTube channel. You can do that and it's free. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few days after this webinar. I'd like to introduce you now to our host for this afternoon, Tabang Matau, who is the chairman of the SAIEE Free State Center. He received his Master's of Electrical Engineering degree from the Central University of Technology, Free State in 2020, and received a Professional Engineering Technologist status with the Engineering Council of South Africa in 2010. In 2017, he joined Group Technology Standard Implementation, overseeing the management of ESKIM's distribution strategic and critical spheres nationally, the investigation of pole mount and power transformers nationally in distribution, and material evaluations and compiler of maintenance and asset management standards. Over to you, Tabang. Thanks very much, uh, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, all the attendees. Uh, please remember to check under the handouts there, you will see our magazine called uh, What Now? It is the magazine for February 2023. There are some very interesting articles for engineering there that you can read. And also remember, SIEE is also offering the training. There's a browser also there under handouts. You can check the training that can meet your requirements. So for now, Chair, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ben Kote. Dr. Ben Kote is the Assistant Dean in the Central University of Technology, Engineering, Build Environment and Information Technology at Central University of Technology. He has published Augmented Reality in Smart Manufacturing, a User Experience Evaluation, and a Hidden Markov Model and Fuzzy Logic Forecasting Approach for Solar Giza, Water Heating, and 12 more articles. He is well-versed in sensors, MATLAB, image processing, instrumentation, electronics, digital signaling processing, C++, lab view programming, and navigation. Over to you, Dr. Ben Kotze, to share the topic today. Thank you. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you are well, and welcome to this webinar. And thank you also for Minx for the introduction, and Mao for you as well, and all the artwork that you are doing. Uh, I hope you all can see my screen. But for starters, what I will uh, say now is that this comes from the heart, this presentation. And what I'm going to share with you is by no means the views of my institution, which are paying my salary, or the Voluntary Association, or whatever census or projects I work on. So this is purely what I see, what I foresee, and what maybe we can do. So in this section, I'm going to talk about education and training in South Africa, and as a lot of things that happened in the past few years, we would see it as a crisis. And my question would be, can we fix it? And then one of my possible solutions would be, is lifelong learning maybe an answer? And the new technologies which we've got at our hands and fingertips, uh, but are they killing jobs or creating them? So this is just a start off. Now, to show you this picture, we can either have full classes or empty ones for whatever reasons we can say. But as schools and educational institutions, tertiary institutions are always pressurized by vast amount of people in the classes, but it is our bread and money. So I've taken a 
took a, a few topics um, and, and, and selected them as problems. And the first one is education for the masses. It's been mentioned by uh, um, the news. Uh, you saw toy toying going on, all of these. So everybody wants education for free. In some countries, it's working. Uh, a, a lot of our students already got bursaries, but it's creating problems for everyone, but possible solutions as well. The second one that I pose is what we were taught yesterday. Is it still relevant for today or going forward? Do we blame lockdown or do we blame technology? What is the issue that we are looking at? Large unemployment numbers compared to creating jobs. Looking at the 2% growth GDP, which is been done in Korea, in China. How did they achieve that 2% growth? How is it going to be achievable? And then the blaming game, is it schools? Is it syllabi? Is it teaching and learning applications? What is the issues there? And then lastly, we in South Africa need hands-on skills. That's our goal. How are we going to achieve it? Now I'm going to start off by looking at the global perspective. And this is technology disruptions. And I've talked about uh, lockdown as well. Is it creating jobs? Yes, we, we have experienced that. But looking at this, a lot of jobs is lost every day. Uh, but the second uh, uh, line I'm stating there, and listen, this is not my word, this is from Capture Documents. It creates new jobs, definitely. In lockdown, people started working from home, new things were sold. Uh, we've experienced this in, in uh, uh, load shedding. So when something bad happens, there's new opportunities. The disruption killing jobs creates new ones in X acceleration. That's also being noted. And then traditional knowledge transfers cannot cope with the rapid change of pace. This graph I took uh, showing and indicating the job openings that's created increasingly from 2000 to 2017. But look at the in interesting fact. And this is what we've experienced worldwide, it's not just in South Africa, that those that's getting hired stays almost exactly the same. So 3 billion workers in the world increasingly not having the skills to meet the growing uh, uh, job positions. Looking forward, the way forward, and, and this was taken for the McKinsey Global Institute report. If we look at what they are saying in in 2030 between 400 million and 800 million people will be displaced or without a job because of automation but this also states that it creates new jobs for workers and especially retraining them countries should invest and then looking at the the <laughs> The amount, 375 million workers to lose their jobs by 2030. So it's not local, it's international. Looking at the following one, and this is where I want to start off with, with my discussion. In 2003, so it's not something new. Levy stated this already. But then looking at where it was published yet again in the future of work. I'm going to come back to this, uh, this working phrase, future of work before. Now, if you look at this, manual labor, it's been taken away by machines, mechanics, automation, robotics. Looking at if you are a little bit more, let's call it clever and, and in a better job, what happens there? Office assistants, sales agents, brokers. They are highly exposed to automation because of the new software packages, new development in automation. What is now not so serious is waiters, aged care workers, protection. Remember, this is crucial in Europe where they don't have these people. 
which is taken over by uh, uh, automation. But now, in a cognitive sense, management, healthcare, technical, and I'm stressing it, technical, engineers, and creators. In other words, they are less exposed. And maybe that is why, even in our country, management positions is taken over by engineers and technicians. But let's move to an African perspective, although you'll see the dollar, so it's European, American, all of these people have exactly the same, but this is a little bit more local. The shrinking budget of people supporting education, and then the knowledge race, in other words, what needs to be taught, what needs to be learned. Now, I've taken this challenge out of a paragraph then looking at from World War II, coming up to 25 years down the line, it's even more now, people learned double the amount of knowledge in 25 years. But now, currently, the knowledge is doubling every year. So in short, we need to teach more for less. Looking at the global shortage of 18 million teachers, Reading that India needs 1.2 million teachers, America needs 2.3 million teachers. Look at this sub phrase Sub Sahara Africa needs a miracle. Quantitative educational products, and this is where most of our educational parties are failing us. How is it easy to up the pass rate, giving old question papers to be studied? Looking at what is now happening. The traditional skills by memorizing easily replaced by automation, by internet, by YouTube, by whatever creating methods there is to learn. What needs to be installed in our training now is creativity, problem solving, critical thinking. I can go on and elaborate. So we need to have people thinking yet again. Now, this is not something new, and there's a lot of things that happen up till now, which have solved some of this. And this is Google. In other words, the 4IR stuff, YouTube, giving or training people which haven't uh, had the chance of fixing something you can learn from. Them. And then in uh, tertiary education and schools, Blackboard, which is used, and then Moodle in schools. Simulations in MATLAB simulating, which comes from researchers. And then Tinkercad, which I will talk a little bit, which is freeware, where you can start do 3D drawing. But what is important for electric and electronic engineers is the programming skills and the circuit building skills, which is now online and can could be simulated. Then something which I'm going to stand on still a little bit is augmented reality, virtual reality. And then later in the news, in the end of 2022, uh, um, uh, chat GDP. Microsoft Sway is not something new. Uh, in the past, coming from 2017, 2018, you could have uh, put an article within this and it would have generated a nice PowerPoint for you. Even an e document or a bulletin. Very nice, useful. So, all of this was used and introduced in the, our educational systems. I'm going to start with a case study. I, one of the problems is how to teach large numbers of students. It's tedious, a lot of work. But what you could do is there's some work that needs a student or a learner to study. And doesn't matter how good you are, you're not going to improve that. Now, coming back to our local system, the SAQWA system, for, for instance, an engineering subject, it would be credited at 14 credits. That means that it's equivalent to 140 notional hours, meaning that if you study or work on a subject for 140 hours and the prerequisite or you to be allowed into the system uh, is adequate, you should pass that subject. This calculates to 12 weeks, approximately six hours uh, during that week. Um, in our case, four theory periods, two practical, that calculates to 72 hours which you spend at CUT or in a classroom or whatever that is. But that's not the 140 hours needed. So now we have to look at assessments. So the student must study tutorials, which also form part of uh, maybe uh, adding to the 72 hours. But what is important, which I want to show you, is the preparation going into this. Now, a student or a scholar won't go on his own or her own and go and study. 
if you don't make him or her interested in the topic or in the study work. So this is where it comes from. Now you could have a nice lesson plan as in the olden days, where you have a, a, a study guide setting out the objective, you have your content, maybe some pictures, videos, audio work, which you can provide to the student or the learner, but they still need to go and do it in their own time and still have to have the interest of doing so. And this is maybe where I want to start addressing these issues. One of them is utilizing a virtual reality. And, and, and this is a case study which has been implemented on a large student groups with a class size of about 48 students. So in other words, the class can accommodate 48 students. But through this class must go 8,000 students, for instance, in a year. How can we achieve this? Because shrinking budgets, I said that is a problem. So what could be done now, and this is now my first demonstration, is you could have something like this, indicating to a student, and interactively the student could see how the classroom should look like or could look like. This is one of the actual classrooms. And introduce something like a safety course, which all the students should be able to do as part of the OHS system in the classes. You have to have the safety. Now, instead of just teaching this by means of a study guide, PowerPoint presentations, as we did in the past, the student can roam through this class, have a look and have a feel of what it is, while the 40, which are already scheduled for this class, is in the class, and have a chance of playing around with all of this. Looking at what is the first aid kit, for instance, playing a video of something like this. I hope you can hear maybe the sound, but it is a video which I could pull down from YouTube, but it's a little bit more interactive and the student gets engaged by his own time and, 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 and uh, uh, own time and, 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 and interest and can learn from this while doing it. The assessments is still taking place formally in class or wherever. Or you can use a learner management system or even this system to test this person. And what I did is say, listen, you have to have an 80% for this safety course before you enter the room. And I can go and check if this person has complied and done all of these training videos, all of these questionnaires, and have answered the proper questions. Example of creating something different interactively and it's a tedious job of teaching 400 students safety and with groups of being divided into 20 groups in India you have to repeat that less than 10 times maybe it's a solution then going to another example this is the machine slab yet again it's got all the equipment to teach someone but you haven't got the space for all the students to fit in. Now, this example is where you have to pass 300 machine students through a lab that can only fit 40. The same example applies. Now, I'm going to quickly see if I can load this example. So I'm exit the lesson. Uh, and then I want to quickly enter it again. Um, oh, golly. Let me just check. It went out of the lesson. I'm just going to quickly enter it. And the student starts the lesson prior to his physical practical and study the equipment, the measurement techniques, how she or he is going to apply it and still do everything which is needed for that practical. But what is the advantage which I want to discuss now is that the student have a chance of doing, instead of only two or three practicals this semester, have a chance of completing 10 practicals, although eight of them may be virtual. The same applies. You have all of this knowledge in videos, in lessons, uh, audios, all of that, and the student can engage with these lessons, and you can say, okay, but this week, those groups are going to do DC machines, the others induction machines, etc. 
So the advantage is yet again that instead of being a bystander, five standing all together at one machine, you can have two or three doing the experiment because they had the experience already in a virtual world. This is virtual world technology. So this is one of the things which could be addressed in such a case. Now, where is the other case studies? And these were from experience with TVET colleges where they need to train people how to well. Yet again, in a week, they teach all the safety, what, which rods to load, what is the settings, all of that. And it's only maybe one day that they get to well. Now you can teach them all these machines, all of the safety aspects, all of the settings, all of these things, which is again tedious and you need to repeat it. And the groups are usually 20 to 40. You can now be 400. I'm coming back to my problem, teaching the masses. You can have 400 enrolling in this course, being taught at least the basics. And those that came out after, say, two weeks, ready for the practicals, engage in only teaching the actual hands-on, which is also one of the problems necessary for creating jobs, doing a welding course. Going towards HT line building for another example. How many of us stood by while someone else did this while we needed to do this for will or practice. So by doing, being a bystander, it's still not giving you the skills. Now at least I can see some of the parts, some of the equipment being put together in a virtual room or an augmented room, being taught how to do this. And I'm not just a bystander. When ready, I can be taken up by a mentor or a mentee into my job experience with much more and broader knowledge before I leave. And not as a standby looking up at the tower or discussing it in a working room. I'm going back to schools. We can have a blaming game. We can say but the schools don't produce the tertiary or the TVET colleges with proper candidates. Or we can say that the tertiary education uh, institutions are failing us. But looking what transpired in documents coming from the Department of Education back in 2009 already, they wanted to face our technology as a subject, introduce a subject called coding and robotics at grade seven level. This is the old standard five level. And look at the topics which they had back then already. Yes, in consultation with uh, us or those institutions or other companies, augmented reality, real world applications in augmented, virtual app reality, all of these topics, real world applications. How is this thing possible for these students to be able to do this? And it's only recently that these technologies came to our front. Because in my studies in augmented and virtual realities and the topics I have covered, covering something which I've already showed you would have taken me three months to prepare. We've got the ability now to do it and to implement it. These courses were supposed to be introduced in 2021 for the grade sevens. We we're already last year in the backlog for catching up already which was supposed to be the great eight. So there is solutions, there is, but the implementation may be lacking. Looking at this, exactly from the same subject content, what are they supposed to learn? Microcontrollers, basic electronic components, switches, batches, grade eight people, grade eight. How many of you have experienced this when you have a first year student or a person at the TV college? What was covered? Now it was, the programming was supposed to be introduced on Python, on the Raspberry Pi, because it's seen as a little bit easier maybe. But if you look at technologies already, I've spoken about Tinkercad, and this is now the Arduino courses, you can already introduce a course similar to that. But this is costing hardware. This was implemented with some schools in the area, in the Free State and the Northern Cape, 
it's cost me 400,000 rand. And after one year, all of those components, all of those equipment, equipment was lost, needed to be replaced. So it wasn't the answer. Then came the simulations. And Tinkercad is not something new. It's already there. And it's freeware. And I can show you here with these examples. These boards look almost exactly the same. If you look at this, if you look at the hardware, the ultrasonic sensors, this on the left hand side is the component from the simulation. On the right hand side is the actual component. So in other words, it's so close, a student can study, get it to work, see how it's working, and have an experience on this already. Now, this is an example of Tinkercad, which is freeware online. And you can see that you can place your components from a library, teach a student what is a battery, what is a resistor, what is an LED, start simulating and look at the code. Now, the advantage is you have the block lead code or blocks programming, or you can see it in actual text as well. So you can have a combination of both, teaching those at lower levels with blocks, and then later on move to C code, for instance. And looking at the simulation, this is a pulsing lead for at one second interval. I just want to close. You can, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but I have a code running on a simulation with a flashing LED example. Just some examples of what can be done already and is done already. Then I'm moving to the robotics training part of it. We have bought some kits, implemented these. Yet again, it's gone after the year. Now you must excuse me, I'm going to try and run this between my cell phone and, and, and the computer. So uh, um, I just want to quickly see if I can get this demo running on my side. It's always when you want to show someone something that it's a little experience. Now, this is an example of a Mars vehicle developed, and you can build in the components. Say, for instance, I use this for the physical key. Now, this is my office. You can see the pieces which I'm working from. I point to my desk, flat surface. I can place this device, which is now my robot, onto the table. I can rotate it, and you will see that even the lighting is there available. You can start by disassembling the parts. I lost my mouse now. Disassembling the parts, ask the person to put it together, assemble it correct way, add labels onto this. And this kid or school learner or even a uh, tertiary institution student can learn and build the solar car, testing it, checking if it's working, and have group discussions because it gives you an option. We call it, uh, um, uh, I've got our spatial meeting. That's the right word for this. And we can have spatial meetings for the graduate at group for teamwork which is difficult to assess, and the person can have a look and see how she or he can achieve this or build this as an example. Going forward, I've spoken about chat GDP. It's in the news. Everybody's worried. How are we going to have this properly introduced? Students are going to plagiarism, plagiarize. So, yes. We can chat about all the negatives as we did when television came out, as we did when cell phones came out, or we can adopt this technology and provide it for us uh, to do. Now, what I did now is this is a, a, a chat bot where you can provide it with a question. It's a yet again, not something new. Although the algorithms produce a, a whole package for you, with regards to the answers. So you can YouTube it, you can uh, Google it, so you'll get the same answers. But what can be done now is could, it could be packaged for you to assist you to create a lesson or to create a document, which would have been taking you far more time than what could be done now. 
Now, what I did here is I wanted to come back to an African perspective where we learn by storytelling. And I said, provide me a story about Central University of Technology. And it jumps off by stating, once upon a time in the bustling city of Bloemfontein, blah, 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 something was created called the Central University of Technology, in short, CUT. And it creates for me a few pages of stories telling me about the history, the, the, the definitions, in-depth technology, if your question was posed as such. And eventually it ends off as the years went by, the repetition of this institution only continued to grow. My storytelling. Changing your class, which you never had time for, into a storytelling perspective for students to learn from. This is also now can be adopted. What's smart about this technology and what we have found in Google is you can start searching in any language almost. So for looking at the DHET perspective of having a language policies being adopted. Now in our region, Sutu, English and Afrikaans is being adopted as the three languages. So what happens now is a student can learn with the technologies and the language perspective that's online, uh, his or her work in maybe a, a, a mother tongue. There's also talks about decolonizing this institution. Now, for me, it's difficult to see how we can change a disaster, which never was found in South Africa, to, to teach someone by doing this. But introducing storytelling now, which I never had class. I can't tell a story in the class. I have to come back to facts, equations, definitions, and cover at least the syllabus uh, hopefully in those 12 weeks. Now I can engage or get the student engaged in storytelling. This is not something new. It's coming from the oldest book being written and translated, the Bible, where people were only empowered when starting to read it and write. Not necessary now for the preach to tell the story. And yet again, maybe this is creating more time for us in the classroom. Because those tedious words, those general basic knowledge, those that you can answer by a question and an answer from Bloom's taxonomy could be covered by this, these interesting technologies. I'm going to now try and explain this in a much more engaged method. This is going to be a little bit more difficult, but let me try yet again. So what I'm going to do, instead of running a lesson, I can start by creating a lesson automatically using this type of technology, which you can now, instead of typing in, chatting with it, I can now talk to the device. Now, yet again, I'm going to place it to my office floor. And what I'm going to create is I'm going to create a teacher or a, a parent or whoever I created. And this was an avatar being created. This is the lady now. I can talk to this lady and say, Transformers. Transformers. It is captured as Transformers. It searched the library. Oh, it hurt me incorrectly. It, it thinks that I'm, I'm talking about now the movies. I don't want to actually listen to Transformers. So I'm going to restate this. Transformer. Gathering some libraries for this. Place a nice picture. Yet again, being asked how to place it, so uh, I'm, I'm capturing it as a a augmented lesson now for the student to get engaged, or I can develop the questions. You can see my lady still standing there; she's giving me a nice shading over my device. She then poses to me a question: "Do ask me anything." 
where can this HD transformer be applied? Oh, she doesn't listen to me, so let me help her a little bit. Where can such a transformer be applied? I'm a little bit too quick, looks like it. Tell me the operation of such a transformer. Uh, the AI bot is dropping me. Must put up my hand. Tell me how such a transformer is operating. It doesn't recognize my voice to this afternoon. I'm going to speak it to the mic. Give me the operation of such a transformer. Okay. Oh, my language is incorrect. Sorry for that. Tell me how the transformer is operating. There it captured the wording. Oh, I, I actually stopped it before I can. Yes, and then the second page, please. Yes. Now. Okay, sorry for that. Let's try and capture another one. The second page, please. Yes, now the second page, please. I told you. Tell me the operation of a transformer. Please. Tell me the operation of a transformer. Okay, guys, sorry. Yeah. Uh, it looks like I'm struggling. But the advantage is yeah, that it, it actually guides you, and then afterwards, you can save it, a lesson, publish it to a marketplace, or whatever the case may be. So, sorry for this. I would have liked this to work properly. It does work properly. I've used it prior to this. So, yes. The AI assistant can assist you by preparing your lessons much quicker, generate PDF files for you, and have the subject content closely related, obviously with the proper questions, and you can see that it doesn't always provide you the right answers, as the internet isn't always to be trusted, as usual. But yes, it's a, a language, talk and ask type of thing, which can get a student much more engaged. In conclusion, the, the few things which I've showed you this afternoon could be used to reach a much wider interactive audience. In other words, instead of going to YouTube videos, read the material to study. If you give the links or expose a student or a learner to this, he or she can then engage with this and the lesson material much more engaged. It is easily to implement. I've talked about the XR equipment, meaning that I can place you virtually in a, in a laboratory. I can place you virtually in the, on the moon. I can get equipment in an augmented uh, uh, manner. If a student doesn't have a robot, doesn't have a multimeter, doesn't have an oscilloscope into the classroom, into his home, and he or she could learn from it, it could be used for everyday life in companies with partners instead of having a, a Teams meeting or a Google Meet. You can have a, a, a meeting where avatars could chat and you could, could see what's going on, maybe. I do agree that hands on skill is still the main aim of the game, but what is the help for me to a student or to a learner? If I teach 40 of them, but only five get engaged with the actual equipment, standing by doesn't help at all. So this is a little bit or a step closer. 
I've talked about job creation. I'm not taking away a teacher's job. I'm not taking away a lecturer's job. I'm just providing you or her with more time to be engaged with this. Looking at industry, jobs that was created with companies which I worked with, gender mark, where we, we are already doing training in the simulated and even assessments on mining trucks. New lithics, exactly the same where we don't even have people that can operate the robot but get taught on it. Asset developers, programmers, designers, I've showed you some examples of transformers. It needs to be uh, drawn, it needs to be captured. Uh, I, I talk about movie makers. Now this is almost a game-like experience. So to get it, if you imagine the old um, Knight Rider and A-Team, for instance, how that is, have evolved to these days by using things like 3ds Max, which is available if you have a license, and for tertiary educational institutions, it's for free. Blender, which is uh, freeware, you can create this lifelike experience. Then looking at gaming, when last did you play a game? And have you seen how accurate the visual experience and then also the learning experience in terms of history, the facts are already. Yet again, we are not in this way. Companies like CUT, Swane University of Technology, Masieta have already joined in teaching robotic skills to help with catch up, help with students, expand this first knowledge of knowledge. I'm coming back to something which I've spoken, which was talked of in 2017. Closer to us, uh, TUT and UP have started in 2021 an international hub for future of work, which is continuing now in 2022, etc. My question posed is this maybe a little bit too late. Maybe one of these days you will see me coming to class and giving a class as my avatar. So thank you all. I hope you have learned something from what I've discussed this afternoon. And yes, all of the best for our future because whatever is being taught today is for us for tomorrow. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Kotze. Um, okay. Uh, we encourage our attendees to ask questions at the moment. We don't have any questions uh, for you. Um, please, um, I have a question um, while we have the attendees to, to type their questions in the questions panel. The, this this um, software that you're talking about, is it, um, does it come in uh, different languages or is it just English? Uh, it is freeware online, so if you start, to, uh, obviously my Arabic wasn't that good when I asked the question, but if you select it as such, and obviously if it recognizes you, these days voice recognition is very good, but you, you, you can do it in almost any language. Um, if you type it, it's even better, but it will give you written word or pictures as if you are doing a search on Google. But yes, um, the, the whole um, uh, advantage or the, the thing which is guided by this, if you have a spatial meeting, we have tested it and had a dry run a, a while back while I was talking in English and the other person was talking in, in French, we could then start to understand each other. Yes, there's a lot of apps already available where you have these type of translations already. Uh, when visiting abroad, you can switch your translator and you can speak on the one side, ask a question, they will hear the actual text in their own language and you could do vice versa. So yes, these technologies are available, it is available, but I see it as an advantage maybe, instead of me learning now French or Sutu or Zulu, I can maybe talk to the device 
And remember, this is in infant shoes now. Uh, and, and this is maybe the reason why chat GDP was launched the end of next uh, last year to learn a little bit more. But this is the idea that we can talk to it and it's very good these days. In Word, in Excel, you can talk to it and it can type for guys like me, which is typing very slow. You've got those options already. Uh, yeah, so in short, it can, uh, I, I think at this stage is covering at least 40 languages to select from, but it's expanded by every day. I hope I've answered your question. That's perfect. Uh, maybe I should get this to do my job. <laughs> working <laughs> do the do the what now magazine write some articles and then i can produce webinars more webinars like this thank you very much dr kotsa i don't see any questions from attendees um tabang do you want to say a few last words okay thanks uh, okay yeah no uh, doctor thanks very much yeah we are moving towards uh, the, the new world now even in the industries they, this can help a, a lot, especially to do a troubleshooting if maybe there's a fault somewhere in the plant. So this uh, augmented reality can help to sort out uh, those problems. No, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Really, it's really in line with uh, 4IR, where the world is moving, even though we don't know what does the future held us. Thank you very much. 100%. Thank you, Dr. Kotze. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matal, for, for your time. Thank you to the attendees for, for visiting us today. I know there's a, there's a few attendees that didn't join us because of load shedding, but the, the recording of this webinar will be on under the Free State Centre playlist on the SIE TV channel to go and watch again. And then feel free to send an email to myself, minx at siee.org.za, if you have any questions for Dr. Kotze or for Mr. Matal. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good afternoon. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.